So in May 2010, I'm on a trip to Morocco. What is a nice Jewish girl doing in a total Muslim country? That is a great question. I was with 67 other young Jewish passionate activist philanthropists, and we were there on what we call a study mission. We are part of a national young leadership cabinet, and every year we go to a different place in the world, and we figure out ways that we can study the culture, the, learn about the politics, and also help while we're there. We did everything from meet with seniors in the senior centers. We, we refurbished an old graveyard in the middle of Marrakesh. We went into the Berber mountains and we handed out candy to kids. And this was our social service work. What we never anticipated was that the most impactful thing that we would encounter was not in Morocco. It was actually on the plane ride on the way home. So here we are on this six and a half, seven hour flight from Morocco to JFK. Um, there are still no direct flights to Chattanooga, I don't know why. And um, I am sleeping because I love plane sleep, especially when my kids are not around, I take full advantage. But in the middle of my plane sleep, I hear on the loudspeaker, uh, excuse me if there's a doctor on board, we would really like to see them, please come see someone at the front. And it kind of dawned on me, except I'm not a doctor, so how can I help? Maybe there's an issue, but I went back to bed. Three minutes later, I get awakened by a second request, a little more urgent. Yes, uh, any doctor, nurse, anyone on board with, with medical training, please see us. And I kind of, you know, wake up, and I'm next to my brother-in-law, who's also on the flight. I'm like, what is going on? He goes, I don't know. I heard something about some woman having a baby. I said, I'm sorry, What? And it turns out there was a 22-year-old African woman on the plane who had never left the country, who had never had a baby before, thought she was about six and a half months pregnant, but was indeed eight and a half months pregnant, and was in denial of even being in labor because she didn't really know what that meant until the person next to her said, are you okay? Yeah, I I'm fine, I'm fine. At least that's what she thought she said because she spoke another language than anyone else on the airplane. As it turns out, she was in labor, and everyone on that plane, as part of our group, we were ready for action. We had five doctors. That's what you do. You would grow up to be a Jewish doctor, apparently, because we had five, but the closest one we had to know be was a spine surgeon. But he was, he was on the ready, just in case. But luckily, whether by fate, by divine intervention, whatever you might call it, there was a nurse on board, a pediatric nurse at that, and there was a midwife. And so they went into action. As my friend Michelle was going down the aisles asking for any extra baby clothes or bottles or anything that she could use when the baby arrived. It was like you know, an impromptu baby shower uh, in the middle of an airplane. And, and we're all around and people are gathered around and we're crying because those of us who are parents know that in the best of situations to bring a life onto this planet is precarious at best. And, and with all of the tools and technology we have, what would we do if we were ever stuck in a situation where we had no, no needles or doctors or nurses or, God forbid, an epidural? <laughs> and 45 minutes after they made that announcement, three hours from JFK, the baby was born, and we erupted in cheer, and we realized then that, that what helped us get through this, what helped her have this baby, was something that's very important, and that's community. That the community on board that airplane, we were strangers, a lot of us to begin with, but everybody played their role, from the nurse to the midwife to even the spine surgeon to the friend running down the aisles doing the baby shower, and then you say, Really, everyone on that plane played a role, right? Like the pilot, he wasn't flying. What did he do? Well, he named the baby Rafin for the place that we happened to be passing over when the baby was born. And as we all came home to our individual cities, we told stories about Marrakesh, Marrakesh and Casablanca and the Berber village, but the story that resonated for all of us was the story of life coming and our community getting together and doing it. A lot of times we say, in order to change the world, it's almost like 
CPR. If you've been through CPR, you know, you go to CPR class and, and they don't say, someone go get help. They say, you know, you in the blue shirt and the jacket, go get help. Because that's what volunteerism is a lot like, that we need to pinpoint someone and tell them what to do and when we need it. But in some situations, this sense of community, this sense of innate responsibility to make the world a better place helps us. And there is one community that inspired me in particular, and it's a small community called Whitwell, Tennessee. It's located about 45 minutes from Chattanooga, where I live. And in that community it are 1,600 amazing people. And it's a very homogeneous community. And in 1998, the principal of the middle school there decided that they needed to look outside their own valley. They needed to see beyond their walls. Many of you may have heard this story before. Um, they needed to understand diversity, so they took on an after-school Holocaust program for their eighth grade class. I won't go through the whole story, but basically, the eighth graders started studying the Holocaust. They were mesmerized by the idea of six million, that number that kept coming up, six million. Six million related to the Jewish people who were massacred during this atrocity. And they said to the principal, Miss Hooper, we can't even fathom 6,000. You know, six million? How can we identify with that? So they wanted to collect something. And what they found on the internet was that during World War II, Norwegians wore paper clips on their lapels as a sign of resistance to what was going on in Nazi Germany. So they started to collect paper clips. They started to collect six million paper clips. And instead of collecting six million paper clips, they got worldwide support for their cause. And to date, they've collected more than 30 million paper clips. In 2001, they received an authentic German rail car that now sits in their schoolyard in Whitwell, Tennessee, population 1600, as a children's Holocaust memorial that houses 11 million of those clips to represent all of those who died in the Holocaust, not just Jews, but all of those who were killed. And in 2004, a film came out, and then the whole world could see what this small community did because they just had one goal, one goal that would say, we want to find out how we can relate to, to this atrocity. We have a goal of making ourselves smarter and broader. We have a goal of wanting to know more, and by doing so, not only did they expand their minds out of their own insulated community, they brought the world to them. They received letters of support from every continent. They housed them in a resource center. And any time you're visiting Whitwell, Tennessee, the middle school, population, 1,600 in this town, you will find people from all over the world who come there because they are drawn by their work and their passion. And Linda Hooper, who is now retired, but as the principal, she left us with a very profound quote. She said, we must choose to create a world where love and respect and acceptance are the rule and not the exception. But more so, she and the teachers of that school did something else. They asked the students to question. And that's hard sometimes when we say, accept this, do this. This is the way it is. Questioning becomes the way that we gain knowledge, the way that we change the world. And so one question, of course, is if we're going to empower and inspire the next generation, who are they? Who is the next generation? To me, the next generation is any generation that comes after us. Because we are only as strong, we are only as smart, we are only as engaged, we are only as educated as those that come after us. And it's not a torch relay. We're not you know, passing them. It's your turn. You go fight the fight. You go make the world a better place. It is a torch lighting because we want to ignite that passion in the next generation. We, my husband and I have three boys, seven, nine, and 11. Thank you for your condolences. And they are, for us, you know, very much so, literally the next generation. And so they have been doing a project in our backyard, otherwise known as let's get the biggest pile of leaves we can, and then let's get the ramp, and let's ride our bike over it. And if we land in it, even better. And so as we were raking the other day, the, the leaf pile is now huge, and I must admit, as fun as it is for them, I am deathly afraid that with all this rain, it's going to turn into a compost pile. Then I don't know what I'll do. Um, but if it doesn't turn into a compost pile, they will continue to jump in the leaves. And as they were jumping the other day, it reminded me of, of just a great analogy that these leaves were like the good deeds that we all do. 
You know, these leaves are like the people that we help in the world. And as we rake them and as we gather them together, you know, they create happiness for us. And then as we take them away, what happens? More leaves fall. And our job is never done. And I asked our children, I actually said, you know, what do you think? Is our job to leave this world better than the way we found it? Worse than the way we found it? Or the same? And my middle son said, what do I get if I get the right answer? <laughs> and I said, you get nothing. You get the pile of leaves. But what he embodies is this generation. I call it the, the whiffum generation, the what's in it for me generation of I'm going to do good and I'm going to change the world, but uh, you got to give me a little something in return. You could also call it the Grinch generation, you know, like, come on, what's in it for me? And I will tell you, when we give back, when we invest in today, when we invest in our future, we find ways that it comes back to us so much more than what we have put in. Look, even the Grinch knew that. You know the story. Even when the Grinch did this kindness, or at least in Whoville they say, that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. It came back to him. And a lot of times, all it takes is an idea. My friend Sammy had this great idea. Sammy is now 19, and he is a senior in high school and about to go off to college. He's an amazing fisherman. He loves to fish. He's a great football player. And Sammy has autism. Not only that, Sammy is a twin, and his twin brother is mentally handicapped. And he has a sister a year older who also has Asperger's. And he is raised by a single mother. Now, with all of that, Sammy has grown up in a world that has only told him he can do, he can be, he can create whatever he wants, and he knows that. And when Sammy was little, his mother planted a little garden in their backyard because she wanted her kids to know where food came from and to appreciate, you know, what we could grow. And when he was about 16, he said, Mom, this little garden that we grow, I, I want to make it bigger. I want to do more with it. In fact, I want to give it back. And Sammy knew that the Jewish Federation in Chattanooga has something, a meals program. And every year they supply 4,000 meals for people all over the community, Jewish and non-Jewish alike. And when Sammy's family was a little down on their luck, they got some of those meals. And Sammy said, you know what, I want to grow my garden. I want to give back to Alice, the cook. I want to give her some of the, the fruits of our labor. Well, his mother knew that the most they ever got out of their garden was maybe a couple of tomatoes, a turnip here, a carrot there, but who's to say that Sammy shouldn't do his part? And so he did double it in size, and he spent every day after football tilling that soil and working it. He never used pesticides or anything that would be harmful, and he worked and worked and worked. And as his mother will tell you, that garden, just because they doubled the plot, it did not double. That garden was 10 times the production of any garden they had ever had. She said, we had bushels of tomatoes. We had cucumbers. We had zucchini. We had Japanese eggplant. We had fruits and vegetables and mint and rosemary and things I couldn't even believe would grow in that backyard with the soil that we had. But when Sammy made his mind up, there was nothing stopping him. And it was not a surprise to Sammy, who took the best of that, the best of the bounty to Alice, so she could make more meals. He then had so much left over that he took it to a friend down the street who had let Sammy fish on his property. He then took it to another woman in their community who had been recovering from breast cancer. And finally, he took it to one of his brothers on the football team whose family had been suffering a hard time, and he said to the coach, do you mind if I give them some fruits and vegetables too? To which, of course, the coach said, absolutely. And so... The family, Sammy's family, again, came upon hard times. They had to move out of their house about a year ago and move into a, an apartment. And Sammy looked back and said, you know, we got to leave the garden, but when I get older, when I get my own house, I'm going to get my own garden, Mom. I'm going to plant my own fruit, and I'm going to keep sharing with people who need it. And she said, I know he will, because as they pulled out of the driveway, Sammy said, stop. And he noticed that their that survived the winter was one little tomato plant and one little mint leaf plant. 
And Sammy jumped out and he got his pots, he repotted it in those, and so now they can enjoy some tomatoes and they can enjoy some mint tea as a reminder of what Sammy grew. And as a reminder that when we invest in our future, when we invest in the generation that comes after us, whoever they might be, the fruits of our labor are obvious. And they don't just double, they grow tenfold when we put in the effort. So now we look back, or we look forward, or we look around and we say, what can we do to inspire and empower the next generation? What can we do to make sure that every one of our acts count? And that's it. It's as simple as, as extending kindness to somebody. It's as simple as, as naming the person who's checking you out at the grocery store by name. Thanks, Carl. I appreciate the help. It's as simple as telling someone they look good in that shirt or telling someone that they sure can have the last donut at the coffee table or even letting somebody in during you know, a traffic jam where you're ready to pull your hair out. Because when we do those things, it makes us feel better. When we choose to do one act of kindness a day, that's it, just one act of kindness. It's the reason I wear a paper clip every day on, on something I'm wearing. It's a reminder to me of my responsibility because it doesn't matter our race or religion, it doesn't matter our, our age or our abilities, it doesn't matter the methods we use or the means that we have. We each have a responsibility individually and cumulatively to make this world a better place. And all it takes is one goal, one question, and one idea to do it. So, what's yours? <laughs>